kindly. Thank you. I greet all of you in Jesus' name. That wasn't me. We just lift our hands for a moment. We stand in awe at your incredible authority and power, your incredible mercy and compassion. We stand in awe, Jesus. We ask you today to touch every mind, every heart. We ask you to minister to us, Lord, as we minister to you. God, set your word on fire. I pray that you would let it find its way into our hearts today that it would affect us. Incredible season that we are in, Jesus. We thank you for your presence. Was here. Thank you for the precious Pastor Don, Sister Don's God, the legacy that they have left us, sacrificially giving the missions. God, that others might receive the same thing that we have received. We thank you for that, their passion. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all you've given to us. We ask you to bless this word, Jesus. In Jesus' name. John 8, verse 3 says, John chapter 8, verse 3. And I want to focus on the sin. I want to focus on the response. Verse 3, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have, have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. First of all, they said, The law says she should be stoned. What do you say? Their intentions were obviously not, not correct. But I just noticed as I read it now, it says, when they continued asking him, they asked him a question, he didn't respond. So they asked again, be careful. Jesus doesn't respond the first time. You might be better off not to ask the second time. Studied this for three days, didn't see that. So, verse 7, when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself, said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. In other words, Jesus was saying, before we criticize somebody else for their failures, make sure we fix all our imperfections. Which Jesus knew that we'd be working on those for a long time. Probably until he got here. Verse 8, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. <clears throat> Jesus was left alone, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. Hmm. The young were the last to leave. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are, are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Notice Jesus' response. There were plenty of evidences and witnesses as to the sin. She didn't de deny the sin. Neither did he even address it. But he did say, I won't condemn you either. But he said, go and sin no more. In other words, 
not continue in sin because of grace. He didn't say, you know, I represent grace, so you just go ahead and continue to do as you please. I want to preach on forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. One more time, Jesus, would you touch our hearts? Would you speak to us? Would you let your word once again, a very familiar portion of scripture, would you let these scriptures come to our hearts? Would you help me to knit them together with the power of the Holy Ghost? Let them attach themselves to our hearts, Lord, that we would never forget what you did for us, but that we would also receive forgiveness. Today we pray in the name of Jesus. Would you just say Jesus' name? God bless you. You may be seated. Jesus did not show up to condemn, but to bring conviction of sin and to set free. So in this scenario, in this portion of Scripture, he confronted the sin through conviction. That's how Jesus confronts sin. Notice he didn't point his finger at the woman and say, why did you do it? Or is this the last or the first time? Or He just allowed conviction. God really impressed me on this. Conviction is truly an act of mercy on God's part. If we are ever allowed the miracle of mercy to touch our hearts, it would be best to respond to that. That is God's way of communicating to us that something is not right with what we're doing. And there is an also, there was also an opportunity, think of it, when the conviction came, there were all the Pharisees standing there, the accusers, and there was also the woman caught in adultery. That act of mercy didn't just convict her. It convicted all of them. When he began to write something in the ground, from the eldest to the youngest, they began to leave one by one because the Bible says they were convicted in their own hearts. Conviction touched them. Their response was to get away from it, to ignore it. It's important when conviction comes that we identify it. We don't run from it. But we say, my goodness, there is, whew, there's mercy attached to conviction. Conviction doesn't mean guilty. When we say somebody has been convicted of a, of a, of a crime, immediately our mind goes to they're either in prison or on their way to it. But conviction in the Bible is God speaking to us, making us aware of something imperfect in our life he's saying now i want you to i want you to look at this for a minute i don't like that after my first service in a pentecostal church i went home and i saw a booze bottle sitting on the counter they didn't preach on alcohol they didn't preach on drunkenness they didn't preach on sin but when i walked in the house god spoke to me he said i don't like that pastor didn't tell me my brother didn't tell me. God just convicted me of it. It was something, and, and I didn't ignore it. I looked at that, and I, you don't like that? No. I started dumping it out within seconds because I said, God, if you don't like it and I do it, then you won't like me. You'll love me, but you won't like what I'm doing. So I, I don't want that to get between me and you. That's, that was my first introduction to conviction. It was just this feeling that God was looking at it going, I don't like that. And, and, and if, if we will be sensitive to that in our walk with Jesus, everyone here wants to go to heaven. But if we will be sensitive to that, then, then we will feel that in our life, that conviction, and identify it and say, okay, something's not right here. Check it out. Figure out what it is. God, what is it? Is it your word? Is it my disobedience? What is going on? And then correct it. And God goes, yeah, good job. But he confronted the sin through the conviction in both the accused and the accuser, yet only the accused took responsibility for her actions. Out of all those people, only the one that was brought to the judgment 
actually responded. Two responses to conviction. The Bible says in our reading, it says they went out one by one. When conviction touches us, we can choose to be like the Pharisees and go out one by one. Or we can go and sin no more. Either you can go out one by one, out of his presence, or you can go and sin no more. The verdict was, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Man in this situation wanted to condemn, but God wanted to forgive. I'm not talking about the sin today. I'm talking about God's response. God's response was to convict and to forgive. This woman was seconds away from being stoned to death. Jesus stepped into her life, brought conviction, and saved her from death because she didn't leave with a wrong intention. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. Thankfully, they don't have it up on the board or up on the screen because I'm reading it in the message because it says what I want it to say. <laughs> <coughs> It says it in a way that makes it a little bit more understandable. This new plan that I'm making with Israel isn't going to be written on paper. It isn't going to be chiseled in stone. This time, I'm writing out the plan in them, carving it on the lining of their hearts. Verse 17, he concludes, I'll forever wipe the slate clean of their sins. Once sins are taken care of for good, there's no longer any need to offer sacrifices for them. Let it go. Many of the commentators mention that the continual sacrifices of the Old Testament were actually used by God to remind Israel of their sin. Every year they had to come and bring sacrifices. And it was just a the Bible says in Hebrews and other places, it said, you know, the blood of bulls and of goats and of calves, it didn't wash away. It was merely a ritual that God commanded. Now, if they didn't do it, they would have been judged immediately. But they still had to do it. And even in doing so, there was no removal of sin. It was merely a withholding of the judgment of God. And, and, and like I said, the commentators, if I, I don't remember for sure, I don't want to say all, but it, re, it, it seems that every one of them were saying that this tradition was that God would remind them that they are sinners. Every time they bring that sacrificial animal to the, to the tabernacle or to the temple, they were reminded that I am not perfect and, and, and that I need God to forgive my sin. And the Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't remove it completely. But then it goes on in verse 26 and 27. After he said, I'll forever wipe the slate clean of their sins. Once sins are taken care of for good, there's no longer any need to offer sacrifices for them. That reminds me. It's important that when you truly are forgiven, when you truly have your sins washed away, it's important that you let it go too. God gave me a word of wisdom on conviction versus condemnation. It's not in my notes, so somebody here must need it. <clears throat> there are times after I got baptized, after I got the Holy Ghost, living for God, praying every day, reading my Bible, and all of a sudden something would come to me about something that I did in the past. And I would think, that's horrible. I feel guilty about it. I feel, and it's like, Someone would, there are times when someone would say, you know, God reminds us of things that he wants us to seek repentance for. But then there was another time somebody said to me, you know, the devil comes and reminds us of our past so that we never get free from it. And, and, and my question to God was, how do I know the difference? I kind of feel the same way. You know, I mean, it's like, oh, I did that stuff. I can't believe I did that. And how wretched of a person I really was. And, and when I think about I think, well, God, I really want to know, is this you or is it the devil? 
trying to remind me, slowing me down, hindering me from making progress in you. And God spoke to me and he said this, have you repented of it already? Yes. He said, then it's not me because I've forgotten it. If you've t truly repented of something and it comes back to you, it's not God. It's the devil. Because watch, if you haven't repented and it comes to you, it has to be God. The devil's not going to tell you something you did to cause you to go to repentance. You're already lost. He's got you. But if you've already repented, then you're free. The devil wants to slow you down and say, no, you can't do anything for God because you've done all this stuff. It's like, God doesn't know about it. Get away from me. I've already repented. He forgot. I might not have forgotten, but he's already forgotten about it. So moving on in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, it says, if we give up, wait a minute. It just said, once sins are taken care of for good, there's no longer any need to offer sacrifices for them. But then it goes on to say, if we give up and turn our backs on all we've learned, all we've been given, all the truth we now know, we repudiate Christ's sacrifice. Yeah, I did too. I said, what is that word? It means reject is having no authority. We look at Christ's sacrifice on the cross and we label it as a reject as having no authority. If we turn our backs on all that we've learned, etc., then it says, and are left on our own to face the judgment and a mighty fierce judgment it will be. I thought it just said that the sacrifices stopped because God accepted. It's saying after that, if we turn our back on what we know, then we will face the judgment without him. It says we are left on our own to face the judgment. In the Garden of Eden, in the ERV version, it says, you know that if you do what is right, this is God speaking to Cain. Cain, like his brother, brought a sacrifice unto God, put it on the altar, and offered it. God accepted Abel's sacrifice. He did not accept Cain's. This is God speaking to Cain after he brought his sacrifice, which was unacceptable. You know that if you do what is right, I will accept you. But if you don't, sin is ready to attack you. That sin will want to control you, but you must control it. What an awesome way to phrase it. Sin wants to control us, but we need to flip it around and say, I'm going to control you. You will not tell me what to do. Now, what I noticed about this, and I'm trying to give you a little insight into the, into the way that God thinks and the way that he responds, and it's this. He said that if you know that if you do what is right, I will accept you. Wait a minute. Cain had already done that which wasn't right. He'd already failed. He already brought the thing that God said, I'm not going to accept that. So, He'd already done what is wrong, and God was pleading with him to correct his mistake. What a God of mercy. He did the wrong thing, and God said, <laughs> now, you must have got up on the wrong side of the bed, Cain. I'm going to give you a chance to correct what you have just messed up at. That's how God responds to us. He says, no, no, no. No, I, I don't know if you weren't listening to mom and dad, if you weren't listening to me, but you did what was wrong. Now, I, I'm going to give you a chance. Wait a minute. We're not even in the dispensation of grace yet. We're sitting in the garden. You see what I'm saying? Or shortly thereafter, and we've got someone who messed up with God, and he said, <laughs> I'm going to give you another chance. Go get the right sacrifice, and you bring it, and I will accept you. This is a God of judgment. And he said, you do what's right, and I'll fix it. But if you keep doing what's wrong, sin lieth at the door. In other words, it's going to attack you, and you won't be able to stop it. So if we've done something wrong, it's important that we stop, turn around, and do the right thing. 
We better never confuse God's mercy with indifference. Don't ever confuse God's mercy with indifference. Cain could have looked at God and said, well, you must not really care because, you know, I'm not dead and I did the wrong thing. Don't confuse mercy with indifference because judgment ultimately came to Cain. Noah, in 2 Peter 2, 5, it says, He spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Noah, according to Genesis, was 500 years old when he started building the ark. That's a long time to be on Social Security. 600 years old when the flood came, which means it was 100 years between the time God said, I'm going to cover the earth with water till the time he actually did. A hundred years. The Bible says that he was a preacher of righteousness. How long does God have to preach to us before we choose to get on the ark? A hundred years. How many people heard Noah say, God is going to cover the earth with water? It wasn't as if you know, they missed church one day. Man, I wish I'd have heard that message. <laughs> hey, Noah, I, I, my kids were sick Sunday. I missed it. This was a hundred years of Noah. God is going to bring judgment. Help me out with this ark. Let's get this thing built. A hundred years. That's a long time. And yet, when it finally began to rain, there were eight people in the ark. Eight people. I had one guy I was teaching a Bible study to, and he said, God wiped out everybody on the earth but those eight people? I said, yeah. He said, he's kind of mean. Man, God's mean. Wipe out all those poor, poor people trying to scratch their way to the top of that ark. That's horrible. That, that's That's horrible. And I said, a hundred years isn't enough warning? What they did is they misinterpreted mercy for indifference. Well, it hasn't happened yet. Let's go do what our flesh wants to do. And all of a sudden it began to rain, which it had never rained before. Abraham stood in God's way when he began to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. Notice this, though. God didn't just go destroy two cities. He didn't do it. He said, I, I, can't, I can't do that without talking to my friend. What God was saying is, please, somebody stop me. I really don't enjoy bringing judgment upon people. I don't want to do that. So would you, would you please pray? Would you please tell me not to do it? Would you step into my path and stop me from destroying Abram was allowed to negotiate with God for 50 righteous all the way down to 10 righteous people. And God said, all right, for 10 righteous people, I won't destroy the city. Angels came into town to warn Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, and anyone else he could tell. Hey, Lot, we're going to destroy the city. Go tell your family and friends. Go, go tell them. He runs, tells everybody. Nobody else comes in the house. Him and his two daughters and his wife. Warning. Let's negotiate it down, first of all. Try to save a couple cities. And then let's let the angels give Lot a little heads up so that he might be able to scrap a few more people together. Didn't happen. God's mercy. Preaching and warning always came first when it came to God. Because God's first response is mercy. Oh, don't miss the mercy that God hands out to us. Don't ever overlook that hand of mercy that comes reaching for us. Because what's following it, his next response is to eliminate evil. Mercy was preaching through Noah for a hundred years. Because he's saying, I'm going to bring judgment into this world. Judgment always came after a rejection 
of mercy. I don't know about you, but that kind of woke me up. If God offers us mercy today, it's important that we don't reject it because judgment follows. We need God's forgiveness. The Bible says in Ezekiel 18, verse 20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. That means the soul that continues to sin. It doesn't mean different sins. It means the same thing. If we don't learn our lesson, if we go do something, we get God's mercy for it, we go do it again. We feel bad, we go do it again. We feel bad, we go do it again. You see what I'm saying? It's God says, I want you to leave that thing at the altar. I want you to cut the head off. I don't ever want you to mess with that thing again. You understand? Don't keep sinning. Doesn't say that in my notes either. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son, notice this, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. In other words, we're all responsible for our own lives, our own actions. It also says the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. In other words, if you produce acts of righteousness, then righteousness shall be upon you. And it says, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins, this is in Ezekiel, the Old Testament. If the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do, everyone say do, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live and shall not die. All his transgressions, oh my goodness, I feel the power of God. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. All his sins will not be mentioned to him. Wow. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? That's a rhetorical question. God is saying no. Saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live, but when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? The answer is no. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. What? I can live righteously? Righteously? for all my life, and I can turn to the ways of iniquity, and it says, none of the righteous things that I have done shall be mentioned. Okay, I'm waking up. It doesn't matter how long I've lived for God. I need to be living for him when the trumpet sounds, because none of my righteousness will be mentioned if I turn back to sin. And in his sin... That he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Matthew 18, 24. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. I think it was like $7 million. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Say he was forgiven. Seven million or seven billion, who cares? To me, it'd be the same. He was forgiven of the debt, the debt he could not pay. Sound familiar? But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Seven dollars. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Sounds familiar. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt. It says it twice. I forgave the debt. 
because you desired me, shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth or angry and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Wait a minute. This guy forgave the debt, and when he wouldn't live righteously, the Lord turned around and put the debt back on his account and said, you don't get out of prison until you pay the debt, which was obviously impossible. How do I know that that, that, that is applicable to today? Because in verse 35, he said, Jesus speaking, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. The Christian world out there needs to hear this message. When we are forgiven and we are delivered, we better act like it. Because if we don't, the debt comes back. And I have debt on my account that I don't want to have to pay. What if God has forgiven me? What if I've been baptized in Jesus' name? It makes no difference. If we don't truly act like we are forgiven, then the debt will return to us. Matthew 6, 15, But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness came to thieves, to prostitutes, a man sick of the palsy, a woman at the well, a premeditated adultery ending in murder. Premeditated adultery ending in murder, as in David. A woman caught in adultery. Religious murderer, Paul. A liar. A hypocrite, Peter. Calvary somehow added a new dimension to forgiveness because it included blood, innocent blood and suffering. Forgiveness is a Greek word, aphimi. The primary meaning of the word forgive is to send forth. We've heard it preached so many times that forgiveness in itself doesn't erase the sin. It merely moves away the judgment or, or grants mercy temporarily. Pastor Jans used to call it a rolling ahead to the atonement, rolling ahead to Calvary's atonement. But it literally means to send forth. Forgiveness says we're sending it forward. But Acts 2.38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission. Some translations use forgiveness there, but it's incorrect because the primary meaning of that word, remission, is not forgiveness. It says, And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The word remission there is not ephiemi, it's aphesis. Aphesis, which means freedom or pardon. It is a different word used for remission. Why? Because Calvary was no longer in the future. Calvary was now in the past. The blood of bulls and of goats and of calves cannot take away our sin off of our record, but the blood of Jesus can. In Genesis 17, this was a covenant between God and Abraham. He said, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Circumcision was the, was the covenant. It was the sealing of the covenant between God and the Israelites, the Jews at that time. And I read that because I'm reading in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. It says, in whom also you are circumcised. What are you referring to? God. It says, in whom also you are circumcised. Circumcision was a covenant, Old Testament covenant. He's talking about a covenant. With the circumcision made without hands. I'm not talking physical, I'm talking spiritual. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What? The, there is a circumcision of Christ now? What is that? What, what is circumcision of Christ? Read on, verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. What are you saying, God? Being buried with him in baptism replaces, in the New Testament, the Old Testament circumcision in the flesh. 
The covenant between God and Abraham has been replaced with a, with a covenant between God and his church. And that covenant is no longer circumcision physically. It's circumcision spiritually. What is that? It is being buried with him, not them, in baptism. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, which is the Holy Ghost, who hath raised him from the dead. That's how I know. What raised Jesus from the dead? The Spirit of God. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, the same spirit that raised him from the dead, then it shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit which is in you. It's the spirit in you that gives you spiritual life. But notice he said, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Verse 14, blotting out. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Blotting out there is a Greek word, ex exilipho, which means to smear out, that is to obliterate, blot out, wipe away. The blood of Jesus Christ no longer is just for forgiveness, but it's to wipe away all sin. In Hebrews 10, again, he said, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Therefore, his blood brought redemption. Without his blood, there is no redemption it says we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness not aphemi but aphesis which means the removal of the sin in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace luke 7 47 there was a woman with an alabaster box and she came and quite dramatically made her gratitude known to Jesus. He said, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Jesus compared the level of forgiveness, not that was given, but that was received. He came into the world to forgive all sin. But he was comparing this woman to someone who was willing to receive forgiveness to the extent that she would go and sin no more. So to truly experience forgiveness, it should cause a like response along with much love toward him. Forgiveness is not walking into a service in saying, God has forgiven all sin and walk out and live like we used to live. True forgiveness gets a hold of us to the extent that we stop doing what we were doing. Not only that, but notice the words of Jesus. If we have been forgiven much, then we will love much. If we haven't fallen in love with Jesus, then somewhere along the line, we have either forgotten about forgiveness or we have not truly received forgiveness yet. Because if we receive it, then we go and sin no more and, and we fall in love with him. The more forgiveness that we receive, the more we fall in love with him. And the more we fall in love with him, the more we want to obey him. If you love me, then keep my commandments. 
It's all tied together. If you struggle keeping the commandments of God, then your love for him is not where it needs to be. But that means that you need to come to the altar and receive forgiveness more because the more forgiveness we receive, the more thankful we are, and the more we turn around and love him more. It is an awesome cycle that you want to get into. Would you stand with me as I close? To be forgiven is to go and sin no more and greatly appreciate his mercy to the extent of sacrifice and to also offer the same to others. The story in closing, 10 lepers. 10 lepers came to Jesus and, of course, all had leprosy. And they wanted to be healed, and he granted healing to all ten. But there was one that noticed his healing. He noticed that the progress had stopped. He noticed that the wounds were healed up. And he turned around, and he began to worship Jesus. He began showing him his gratitude for what he had already done. In other words, he was grateful and began to love him. The Bible says he worshipped him. Healing for a leper would have stopped the progress and also stopped the pain. But when this man went away from Jesus, Jesus said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Nine went away healed. No progress and no pain anymore. But one of them went away being restored to normal. Whole as if he had never had leprosy. Forgiveness is like healing. It's given to all that ask. But wholeness, restoration, is only given to the thankful and the worshipful. Forgiveness stops the pain. But remission is as if you've never sinned. These altars are open right now for someone who wants to receive. <clears throat> receive forgiveness so that you might create love and thankfulness in our heart that we might receive power that we might understand the depth of his sacrifice I know you've been here before you've been at the altar many times but today I'm asking God to help us truly receive I have asked him so many times God why is it some people can come to the altar and their life is absolutely changed. Others receive an experience from you and yet their life never changes. The forgiveness is the same, but the receiving of that forgiveness in some instances is very deep, very meaningful. In other instances, it's very shallow. I just want the pain to stop and I don't want to die. That's shallow. That's healing. But restoration says, I want to be changed. I want to fall in love with you, Jesus. I want to fall in love with you. Help me to receive. Help me to realize that the, since the pain has stopped, that I come and begin to worship. Because worship brings His presence. His presence brings a miraculous change in the Spirit as we receive His Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. We can take this a step further, folks. We can fall head over heels in love with Jesus. That's what this message is for. Receive His mercy today. No matter what happened yesterday, Jesus, I want to experience Your mercy and Your forgiveness because I want to fall in love with you. I don't understand all this Pentecostal stuff. It doesn't matter. 
Fall in love with Him for Calvary. Fall in love with Him because of what He's done for us. Fall in love with Him for the fact that He hasn't judged us yet. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for no judgment in my life. Thank you for mercy that has been extended. I won't, I won't reject that mercy today, but I'll receive it unto myself because I need it. I need your mercy and your forgiveness, Lord. Would you open your heart to him this morning and just let forgiveness begin to flow. It'll clean out all the garbage. It'll clean out all the failures of yesterday. Help us to turn, Jesus. Help us to turn towards you. Would you just worship him? Let's worship him right now. Is you your love never fails? Your love never fails. You're the hope of all hearts. The hope of. 